This is Natani Hanley uh, in the New Media Lab. This is going to be our fourth American Indian Lit Review. We read Sacred Places, uh, Indigenous Perspectives of Leadership, written by Linda Sue Warner and Keith Grint. I am uh, here today with uh, Nate and Noel. Okay, I'm Nathan Johnson. I am a junior here at MCC. Uh, my name is Noel Teller, and I'm finishing up my second year at MCC to transfer to ASU in the spring. Okay, great. Uh, let's hop straight into it. So what do you guys think about this article? I thought it was pretty powerful in the things that it was conveying and kind of the reflection of our parts of our history um, and also pointing out really key points and how that we're not really represented on the same level in religion. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Even though like religion's part of like the constitution, yeah. yet we're not, we don't get the same type of benefits, not benefits, but the same type of just plain rights. Yeah. And I think I was definitely um, very prevalent, especially when it got into talking about um, how we're kind of treated in regards to uh, our Religious Freedom Act. I believe it was uh, the Native American Religious Freedoms Act. And um, yeah, and, and I actually have a quote here. It says, um, the Supreme Court has consistently failed to protect religious freedoms for American Indians. And I also believe that actually is true, um, especially within the recent years that we've started to head towards a sort of um, um, like a especially conservative sort of view. Um, I also believe that um, I also agree with the article and when it says in spite of both of these laws, including NAG, uh, NAGPRA and then again the Religious Freedom Act of 1978, that um, there is current no legal protection and there's really no way to actually defend sacred places against desecration or destruction. Mm -hmm. And I think that alone kind of says volumes in regards to um, how much uh, I guess the United States actually pays attention or even cares about um, uh, American Indian in, uh, American Indian rights, especially in regards to religious freedom. I think it was also interesting, uh, I want to state that uh, the article opens up with um, talking about um, our place in, uh, in the world and then how this sense of place has uh, different meanings for different people. And I think that is uh, very accurate, especially when it comes to the 500, I believe it's 77 different tribes here that are fairly recognized. Um, but I think it's also important to note um, that this all likes it all links together uh, between sacred places, leadership, and also identity. Um, uh, and specifically, it likes to it talks about um, there's two different vignettes that was offered in the the writing that I would like to uh, bring up. One was in regards to um, I believe her name was let's see here Legalis Harbrook. She uh, became a principal at uh, Kelsey Deaver Elementary School, which was actually ranked as the, the lowest tier in the state of Alabama, where she began to reestablish a sense of place and identity for her reservation school. And then also again, they talked about um, in Vignette 2 about, a, a co I think it was a Oklahoma Choctaw, that his name was Adam B. Bull Jr. And he was uh, forcibly placed onto the Navajo reservation where he himself actually made himself a home. Um, with uh, the community there. And I thought that was very interesting because um, it I honestly kind of shows uh, how adaptive American Indians can be and also kind of how we can uh, sort of make that sense of place our own. Mm -hmm. Especially when you come from like a different tribe. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, you? most definitely. I think when you just like be around other Native Americans, like being at the Native American Center we have here too, we all feel like a cent we all feel like at ease you come out, you come out, like for me, you, well, not really necessarily me because I went to a border town school. So that's yeah. why my mom sent me to a border town school was to get used to seeing how it is to be with other. Kind of like mix in yes, with other yep. worlds. And so I thought that was kind of cool that my mom did that. I didn't see it at the time. I just thought, oh, yeah, I get to get away from home. But usually, like when I came out here, I didn't have any friends. And so yeah. when I heard about the Native American Center, I started going there. It's just, it's just cool to see people where you come from. Like. My friend Dalen, people from like other other parts of the reservation, you don't talk to, but you see them. And then when you come out here to a city, you're like, oh, hey, wow, what's, what's up, up dude? bud? It's yeah, cool. it's just yeah. cool to see someone where you come from that can relate to your story. 
So I think it's also cool because you did bring up uh, American Indian. Uh, you also did bring up the American Indian Institute here at MCC, which is actually really cool because uh, um, the American Indian Institute here actually is like a living example of um, indigenous people making their own sort of sacred place um, before we uh, now MCC has the largest enrollment rate of American Indian students out of all of the other uh, colleges in the district. Um, and then on top of that, we are also one of the few colleges that has uh, an American Indian Institute here to support and provide for the American Indian students on campus. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a shame. Um, we don't see as many people as I would like to, um, but we, uh, it doesn't change the fact that American Indians have made a place here on campus for themselves so that way we can, um, so our students can prosper and move on and have that easier transition into um, community college, into university life. That's true. So I read a quote in here when he said, contrary to people, to popular belief, education, the transmission and acquisition of knowledge and skills did not come to North America content on the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria. We Native Americans have educated our youth through a rich and oral tradition, which was and today is transmitted by the elders of the tribe. Which is true. It's like, if we were com compared to kids now, they just go to school to go to school. And some kids, it's like thinking about the kids who, who don't care about school. They don't have the elders there to say like, this is how we did it. Like back then, we were told like we should do this and this is how we should do it. We were strict about it. But now kids today are kind of getting, parents aren't really strict with them. So that's why they start doing dumb stuff at a young age. I also agree with that to um, a certain extent. Um, but also, I would also like to say that's not the entirely the contribution. I did a quite a bit of little research in regards to um, the schooling system in regards to K through 12 and how it um, relates to American Indians. Mm -hmm. And it shows that the entire K through 12 system is not fit for the American Indian needs um, that our children have when it comes to education. Um, as most people know, American Indians are very um, hands-on oriented. And then on top of that, we, um, it's, a, it's vital, very vital that we have our family, community members, um, anyone that honestly is a part of our life or really close to us be a part of our education system. And I think personally, I believe that, uh, our, our generation today is not doing enough in regards to making sure their students are feeling welcome, comfort, um, also making sure that they're actually having, um, they're actually getting help in regards to getting through their issues at school. Cause I believe that, um, I believe a lot of uh, tests and federal studies will, uh, back me up when I say that um, I think in regards to graduation dropout rates the reason why it's so high is because uh, the children either don't feel connected um, they do not feel involved in their education system in their education or they just feel like they're kind of a liability and they just don't want to try anymore so I, I can't really fully agree saying that it's completely in regards to like the problem is on our ants on our elders heads mm -hmm. as so much as it's ourselves as well as our ancestors. Um, and I also think that's very important when it comes to the question of what do we do to maintain our identity? Because um, we're, we're all Navajo here, so uh, Navajo identity is very strong within us and we would like to remember certain things of our traditions and our ceremonies, like uh, Hojonja and um, um, I think it's Ki or something like that. Um, but yeah, I feel like that is very important um, what do you guys think we can do in regards to maybe maintaining our identity after reading this uh, article? Getting to know our past. And then not only that, like spending time with our elders. You know, back then they were always like the mom would send the kid to go hang out with their grandma for the summer. Yeah. And that's where they learned the stories, how to speak the language. How to chop wood. Yes, how to <laughs> chop wood. It just makes you mentally strong, too, because your grandma, she don't care how tired you are. She'll be like, go outside nope. and chop wood. It don't matter how <laughs> early it is. They'll be waking up at 4 in the morning with no alarm clock. Outside, bro. Yeah. One thing I found, how I kind of keep my cultural identity and that was strengthened, actually, was when I first took my first uh, Navajo government class here. And to learn about our history and how that they really... And 
how the Navajo government was initially based or they kind of transformed into was that they want to connect the two of um, our history and moving forward and taking them both hand in hand. And so it's really interesting how I read this was that there's so many different aspects to being um, Native American that people compartmentalize in the like the modern day. Yeah. You know, you know, Sunday I'll go to church and then Saturday I'll go ahead and have my me time. Yeah. I'm just saying like in (laughs) general, people have a different structure, but us like it's almost completely as balled into one. So it's very almost like in a it's like three dimensional in a sense. And um, there's different aspects to it that kind of make it that kind of way. And so that and one thing I want to point out is like in the Navajo government is that we kind of what is a part of the Navajo government is perseverance and sovereignty. Yes. And we also include, you know, in the government how it's different than uh, even though it's kind of based off of how government runs today because they have to interact Mm -hmm. is that they. um, Quick little tidbit is actually the government was based off of our way of governing ourselves and that they they got our idea for their democracy from the Iroquois uh, Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And just like they go hand in hand and so it's not compartmentalized how it is everywhere else we it's just all kind of one even how the language is structured and Mm -hmm. how we talk about things we talk in almost like phrases and how we have to explain things to other people um it's kind of like the same thing of how we how we kind of like take ourselves so with that um how i kind of keep my identity is trying to have the same type of structure and how um with going to school i it's not a matter of like what's going to happen tomorrow of what do I want in 10 years? It's kind of a thing of like, I take my history with me and how I go to school and what I wanna do in life. Some people Mm -hmm. go to school and all they know is like, I need to get a good job. But personally myself is like, I am, you know, woman, Mm -hmm. I am Native American and, you know, issues that I've heard about in our history, I take that with me and how, you know, one day when I'm set up enough, I wanna help Native American youth yeah, And as Eddie mentioned earlier, I never really realized how much our generation is different than people who are graduating. Yes. And Most how they kind of, they're losing that. I, I, I never really realized I don't spend a lot of time with them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something we can also try to do is spend a little more time with our youth of uh, being ourselves and kind of sharing our experiences and things mm-hmm. like that. And even though we've learned from our elders, maybe we have a closer age range to talk to them and discuss things because they i don't this is huge different thing of how we would listen to our grandparents and how we listen to our parents and how they listen to their grandparents and how they listen to their parents and maybe we're a little closer it would mean more yeah from us yeah like same age around the same age it would mean more it would stick with the person more rather than like it's not just some old dude talking yeah exactly that's what i was gonna say like this guy don't know what he's talking about you know what i mean Yeah. yeah most definitely but that's true. I like what you said. Like, when I go to class, it's sad. A lot of Native Americans don't even think, like, oh, I'm Native. I'm just going to school. Like you said, I'm just going to go get this job. But at the same time, my way of thinking is, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take advantage of this. I'm going to go to school. My tribe's helping me out. My chapter house is helping me out. And we have so much. We we literally, as Native Americans, have no excuse. We, have we don't. So, we have so much opportunity. We have stuff that are aiding us, helping us. At the same time, it's like I I want to go to school because I feel like it's going to be a slap on. It's going to be like slapping my ancestors in the face because they wanted us to go to school in order to be successful. Mm-hmm. They didn't always want the white man to be up there on the top. Why not be with them or above them? Agreed. Especially with like Chief Manuelito. I was going to say, yeah, Chief mm-hmm. Manuelito. Exactly. Word, up, word up to Chief Manuelito. Yeah, because like when you learn in the history, like he sent his two sons to go to boarding schools Mm -hmm. and what ended up happening to them got sick and they didn't come home but he still advocated for education we have scholarships you know that's true from chief manuelito and you know we all need to go to school and kind of like be in the classrooms and be in the workplace and you know be in the government to really take those issues that we talk about and we read about and actually take a huge action on them yeah, I believe a lot of our older uh, leaders, including Narbona and Manuelito, they they wanted us to um, 
uh, I guess they really want us to learn the Anglo-Saxon sort of ideology and I guess uh, for lack of better words wanted us to learn how to I guess play the game and then adapt and hopefully play it better so that way we can turn it in our favor and I think that's what uh, Chief Manuelito and Narbona really wanted uh, when they th- when they advocated for us to go to boarding school even through mm-hmm. the horrors and the traumatization and the abuse that our uh, our f- uh, friends and family had faced. Mm-hmm. Sure. And can I also like point out if anybody actually listens to this and they hear about things, <laughs> it's like, oh, and if you're not native and you listen to this or you are native, you need to kind of have the realization or at least like have know the fact in your head that like, you know, personally I had my grandmother, she went to a, bo- a boarding school, mm-hmm. you know, my grandfather, you know, they, these things that we learn about in history, we think they're so far, you know, really so far, not. it's not, it's, it's really still not with us. It's like the whole uh, argument that uh, African Americans get when in regards to um, people saying that I shouldn't have to, I don't owe you anything because it wasn't me. It was my grandfather, my great, 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 great grandfather. Um, but I just feel like personally that's not really the issue at hand of who owes who. It's more so um, protecting and uh, trying to um, revitalize an entire culture and language. Because um, just imagine one day waking up and if you're Mexican or you're African American or just your entire whatever ethnicity you identify as, you just wake up and your entire life is just gone. You're just a number, another face in the crowd pretty much. You don't practice ceremonies. You don't do anything. You just kind of wake up, go to work, go to school, go home, go to bed. Like, that's it. And I think there's other, one, one other thing that I wanted to point out really quick yeah. is like with um, NAG, PRA, and also the legal, yeah. illegal protection and of what we currently, you know, these acts were passed and, you know, maybe like a year before I was born. I think one of them was passed in 1990, or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, and it's, or even, you know, it's like within my generation before, like right before I was born, you know, like this was just barely passed. Yeah, some of our grandparents actually had hands in creating some of these laws that mm-hmm. we now have today that have given us our rights. Like uh, even actually just within the past, past few 50 years or so, we barely just got our rights to actually vote. Yep. We barely got legally recognized as United States citizens, even though we technically were for since the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> we got voting after women, yep. and then African Americans, yep. and yep. then American Indians. Always last. But one thing is, like in recent years, I don't, I don't, I'm not too up to date on it right now. But like with the Bears Ears Monument, and you know, yeah. the uh, with President Trump, and saying pretty much you're. I pretty, I'm pretty sure, like, I don't know if this is, like, completely accurate if you were to go from, like, a journalist standpoint as they just want to exploit the resources at Bears Ears Monument. That's honestly what it feels like, especially when November rolls around and it's Indigenous Heritage Month. It's It just feels like, uh, you know, we care about Indian politics for maybe one good minute and then as mm-hmm. soon as December hits, it's all about Santa Claus, good old Saint Nick, you know, the old <laughs> classic Anglo-Saxon <laughs> idea of celebrating Christmas. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, definitely important, especially around this time of year to kind of talk about leadership and how it relates to spirituality, because, uh, I, I think we just passed our treaty day, the Navajo treaty yeah. of 1868. And, uh, especially with issues like that, fortunately enough, our generation never has to face a physical ethnic genocide at their doorstep. Nowadays, it's a little bit more under, under the blankets, more systemic. Um, you can, it's plainly uh, shown in regards to how um, the U.S. government interacts with um, foreign foreign nations, including um, the 577 different uh, American Indian nations. Um, an example of this is um, when the Comanche Nation was trying to save Medicine Bluffs from being um, built upon, uh, in order to actually obtain a preliminary injunction the tribe needed to show a substantial likelihood of success on the merits so they're saying that this land had to be successful financially Mm -hmm. uh, that irreparable harm to the tribe if the injunction was denied so the tribe had to literally be in harm's way if this was denied and that also the threat and harm to the tribe outweighed any harm to the u.s army that alone says uh, a lot of words to me to me it states that the u.s army holds more value than American Indian yep. nations. Um, lastly, the issuance of the injunction cannot be adverse to the public interest. So, in other words, it cannot go against what the pe- what the people think. The people all the, the United States government has to agree with the American Indians in regards to that this is a needed injunction. Damn. 
fortunately enough, though, Wallace Coffey, in regards to his knowledge of um, traditions and ceremonies, he was actually able to um, preserve Medicine Bluffs and keep it up and running for ceremonies to come. And that will lead me into my next little piece I want to talk about is um, what did you guys think was the link between sacred places and leadership? Um, as I stated with coffee, I think it's very important for um, American or indigenous leaders to be knowledgeable of their ceremonies and their traditions and, mm -hmm. and honestly, even their language. Oh, yeah. What did you guys think? I think sacred places into leadership. It's like you have to you have to. <coughs> Be on you. It's like growing up in your own little um, town on the reservation. You know what needs to be done. You see, you see what's the pros, the cons, and what needs um what needs attention. You know what I mean? Most definitely. So if you if you know where you come from, like your sacred place, my sacred place would be Round Rock. I was born and raised. I love it there. So I would see all the problems there. And then when I my goal is to get out and then come back with education the knowledge and go rebuild my my town i know what needs to be done but not just my town i could help out other other um towns on the res because we're exactly the same we lack a lot of things similarities but that's what i take from it that's what i say is the link from savior places to leadership mm, i think about it for a second real quick i just want to say that um that i believe uh, one of the issues that we are having today with American Indian leaders is that uh, I feel like me personally, and this could just me being an open-minded, optimistic Indian, but I just feel like a lot of our leaders nowadays are very tunnel visioned when it comes to politics. It's, mm -hmm. I, and I know, I know it's always about my people first and getting yeah. my people better, but I always kind of felt that, um, yes, we need to focus on, for examples, because we're all Navajos here, that we need to focus on the Navajo Nation. We need to make sure we're prosperous. But the thing about the Navajo Nation is even though we're the, the wealthiest and most prosperous out of most of the other nations here in the United States, uh, there's really no difference in regards to what's happening on Pine Ridge and what it looks like and what it looks like on the Navajo Reservation in regards to exactly. crime, crime rate, all that stuff. And I just think that maybe if we kind of, especially tribes in uh in a better position than others again like the navajo tribe i just think that i or maybe i shouldn't say we i think that i should more so say that i just don't understand uh why we can't lump in other tribes or at least try to attend for other tribes um at more so than we already are because we are um interacting with other nations and uh creating relations with those nations but i just don't feel like we're um being i guess uh as collective or not being it as completely as a collective as I would like to see in my generation in regards to Indian politics. I think there was the first part in, um, in the intro, how they talk about how it, Native American leaders are sometimes become martyrs because they try to follow the same system that we have, you know, like oh, we mentioned earlier, we have to kind of like play the game yeah. of how things are set up, whether, you know, in legislation, because it, don't know too well how like the Navajo government interacts with the U.S. government because it's a, had like a very small tidbit on how they kind of like really really interact and how money goes in and how money comes out or That's how we enact yeah. things yeah and with that it's um, whenever certain whether whether it's like a Native American legislator or president when they go ahead and get into that world it's kind of harder to go about because sometimes when we elect you know a Navajo Nation to go us ahead and they elect their leader um their president it's you know there's the requirement of you need to know Navajo yeah. or you need oh, to yeah. you know we want them to know the history but I see where you're going yeah with the education of how to actually play the mm -hmm. stem of like hey like I went to you, know, you have we have Native Americans who go to Yale Harvard sometimes yeah, Dartmouth. You know, yeah mm -hmm. Dartmouth and it's really hard for them to come back because they almost feel, you know, like you're, they, there's this huge kind of like displacement a little bit. And yeah. then there's the ones who oh, stay definitely. under definitely. Yeah. Especially if you leave, you get accustomed to the area you go to and then you come back and. You get labeled. They, yeah, you get labeled like you're a city kid. Yeah, you're, You might real. as well be white. Yeah. Like you talk white. Like yeah. Me. I'm just but speaking proper English. I like what you said. There was a president, um, or there was a running, a Chris guy. Chris Cheatney. Yes. And he, he was well educated, huh? Yeah. And so. My grandma had a good point 
and I asked her because I was like, I already thought like, dang, this guy's well educated yeah. compared. I forget who he's running against, uh, but but anyways, the point was my grandma was like, we, I would choose him because he's well educated. I don't care. Um, yeah, I want our younger generation to know our language, and that's what he didn't know. He didn't know how to speak Navajo, but she was like. He went off to school to get an education, and he knows what it takes, and he went through the hard work. It's like he went to school for nothing. He wants to come back and help us, and we're not letting him when he has more knowledge. But she's like, um, all us uh, older elders, we're, we're stubborn. We think, like, the younger generation is, they don't know any better, but at the same time, we should embrace and see what the younger generation brings and what they can do for us. And it's our time to finally, like, step down, stop being, like, stop saying, oh, they don't know. They're they're new. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's our time to start coming up and start helping our elders. Yeah. And another thing is it's really, like, unfortunate with, like, our, I, I don't know if this is the right word to say, but socio dis, social disparities yeah. and, like, our history. And it's, yeah. like, we have this weird just kind of, like, gap in our generations of, there's only a few percentage who actually know Navajo, but yeah. their parents have been off the reservation and pushed them to go to school. Or like we have enough, um, enough, of, I don't know, like enough common, uh, not common skills. You know, there's like different ways you kind of interact with people and how you're able to climb the ladder yeah. in school or in the world. And if you're given, if you have those type of skills or you, some people don't and mm-hmm. it's like they know the issue but they stay at home it's just it's really weird but like like i was trying to say with um that gap it's like i personally don't know navajo because my grandmother when she was in boarding school she didn't teach it to my mom they kind of had to learn on their own they only know certain words we can't have a full conversation but it's just because she feels really like drawn back to even you know share about her experience nonetheless of try to like repair what's been taken and Most so definitely. Yes. it's it's really it's really really funky and it's a huge um it, it, i don't even know how you would address the issue of kind of like t- you know and that's also key like it's key in like our leadership and how you know we're going to fight for you know in the legal system of what's sacred and what needs to be here and what needs to be in place for our, you know our future students or future um peoples Most definitely and then I have a question I actually wanted to ask you guys when I got finished this um, article. And uh, in in my opinion, or let me just ask a question, I guess. And that question is, um, do you think this, this uh, plurality of lives that American Indians are placed in is causing a blurring effect for them? And what is that could be causing a lot of the issues we're facing today is just we're so caught up in the three different lives we're supposed to live as a United States citizen, a state citizen, and then a being uh, native. Yeah, being a, a member of our native nation as well. And I, in my personal opinion, I think um, because of that, that plurality of lives, it, it kind of muddies, muddles the water in regards to like what we want to see and what we want to do and and try to help out that we just get so tired um, of the issues and all the problems because within the past 40 years, we're still talking about missing indigenous children, mm-hmm. um, sexually assaulted women and children. And there's no ra- statistics on it. Yep. No, ra- then there's racism. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. all these issues have been here for over 50 years now, but they're still happening. And I think in regards to not just Indian issues, but then there's also United States issues. And then on top of all of that, you also got to worry about your state issues. So just a quick little example here to give you an idea, you would have to think about maybe your cost of living going up in your state. And then on top of that, maybe the national, um, the national uh, pay wage for, um, uh, what's it called, part-time employment or full-time employment has been reduced. So that way, instead of making... Um, what you're making now in whatever state you are, you're making, let's say, 10% less. So there's your state cost of living you have to think about. There's also the national wage being dropped. And then on top of that, you also have to worry about the own economy that's happening on the American, or on the reservations as well, which is never really changing. It's always it's uh, the same. It's yeah, always, yeah. Dispar- it's always yeah. a disparity. You only have jobs when you work with the tribe, and that's mainly just for the women. 
You only see the women. You only, you only see the women. The spaces. You only yeah. see the women's working for the tribe. Yeah. And the men are always working construction. They have to leave the reservation. Only get a week or only like a day and a half with their kids, and then they go travel to wherever work is again. Yeah. yeah. So I. So what do you guys think in regards to that whole plurality of lives? Um. Have you guys ever noticed it? Oh an, yeah. It's definitely. Like, it feels like a big undertaking. It's like. You feel like, I feel like if you have a, if you know, all of us, I feel like we have a strong sense with our history and yeah. what we want to continue with and how we want to fix issues. And it's just like, you know, we have to think, you know, it's what comes first. Yeah. And where do you start? How do you tackle the issue? And it's a lot. It's like, three different things and I don't know. And again, it's always like usually the same three things. Yep. Let's see here. But I think what was really interesting most of all uh, out of this article that we read um, in regards to sacred places and leadership is that American Indians have always been very resilient people. Um, you can see this through their sur survival, through genocide, system systemic genocide, conversion, Mm -hmm. um, just anything you name it really but through it all they have managed to create sacred places for themselves they even when they were forced into these dark sacred places place like Bosque, uh, Bosque Redondo um, that is a very it's I guess what you can equivalent to as a, a, um, a, a concentration camp and, oh, yeah. uh, and of course, as you all know, uh, Adolf Hitler got his ideas of concentration camps from how the U.S. treated American Indians. How citizens. they made reservation. Mm -hmm. yep. And so um, I just think it's very important and actually very interesting that um, there's cases within th this um, this reading that talks about American Indians changing their place um, so, th so that way it becomes sacred, whether it be for good or for bad. Again, there's Bosque Redondo, and then there's also the four sacred mountains that Navajos have. You know, one's more good, fortune, blessing, um, our homeland basically, but then there's Bosque Redondo, which is like, again, it's like a concentration camp. It's just very solemn, and we can recognize um, what it's done. And it's even more interesting that it goes on to talk about how Native Americans pretty much created dialogues that will inform discussions of sacred places and mm -hmm. how to refine the link to the leadership. Um, I believe that if we can explore this sort of uh, conscience, we can probably pump out a lot more trustworthy, more effective um, leaders for our nations, whether it be the Navajo Nation, the Six Nations. Um, I honestly don't think it matters. I just feel like we're missing something on Indian in Indian uh, country and I think that thing is is just proper leadership especially in the Navajo reservation where we've had multiple cases of um, of uh, corruption and bribes mm -hmm. taking pocketing money that is supposed to go towards programs to help our people um, I just think that there needs to be a massive change uh, in regards to our leadership and we need to have more people that are thinking of the role of tribal leaders as the way it should be, which is maintaining a spiritual connection while maintaining um, foreign affairs, all while juggling the wealth and health of your community. Whereas most leaders don't really have to worry about that. It's more on a maybe macronomic level where it's just a country. Mm -hmm. Whereas we Native Americans, we've always thought about the country, the state, and our nation. And I think it's very important and that should be something that our leaders should recognize nowadays. I think it's also important that leaders identify located space that is tribally specific as well. I think one way that we could kind of, um, I guess, kind of transform to see what we want to see in like tribal leaders, because honestly, like, I feel like one day Tani can be a tribal leader, Nathan can be a tribal leader, or be the one who speaks for us or on behalf of the people, and knowing that they know our issues and I feel like if we were to it's like a program I'm just thinking of like this is just one type of idea yeah, or some type yeah. of solution mm -hmm. is like if we were to have like a thing where we go ahead and set up a leadership kind of program where we do 
I mean, maybe you go to like the sacred places or you hear from elders about what they think that we should do and what we should, you know, should carry with us and what we should know to do whatever it is we want to do in our life, whatever it is we want to do for our nations. And so maybe it's something we could do is like, I only say that because I've been a part of like student leadership institutes yeah. where we, we've done things like that, but it's for different areas. It's just kind of in general. But the thing is though, we don't live in general. We live as Native Americans. Yeah, We have very specific areas to our lives and where we come from that is much more significant that almost like Mm -hmm. it is like tied to sacredness it's like tied to almost like how people practice religion so if we were to be able to do that and strengthen that we can um prepare our students or not even just students but the people that we need in on our reservations and off our reservations to kind of keep the two interconnected. Most definitely. And um, I also believe that um, tribal leaders have to be very knowledgeable and very informative about sacred places in regards to how they relate to the people. Um, And I guess just culture overall in general, you know, land, language, culture, I believe all of it is very relevant to sustaining the collective citizenship and identity that American Indians really need. I also believe that the land or place that we decide to live in or habitate is not an artifact of Indian culture. Um, I don't ever believe to think that, you know, Arizona, Utah, Four Sacred Mountains are Navajo land. It's not. It's the people's land, but it's sacred to the Navajo people. doesn't mean we own it. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're responsible for it. It it also means, like, we're looking out for it, too. Because, you know what I mean? Because people want to do stuff. Well, I should say, like, white men want to do stuff that will later on... Anglo-Saxon. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and then it hurts. It comes back and hurts the environment. But most of all, we're not just saying because it's our land, but we're looking out for the land. Yeah, and I, I think what a lot of people don't really understand in contemporary years, especially in regards to the whole American Indians being... Um, uh, subservient to, like, the land and caring for it and just having that sort of... Um, I guess servitude and that's what will translate into the whole hippie movement in the 60s or 70s I hmm. think whatever that mess was um, but I just I think that people get the idea twisted when it comes to why we do it it's not in the sense that because we're nature loving and we're one with nature and this and that and though some tribes do believe that um, it's not so much about that is so much as of uh, it's it's a place of where we live. It's a place that we've made history, and um, our our, fan, our friends, our family, our ancestors were all on this land at once, and we recognize that. We recognize the importance of what we have, where it came from, and where we want it, where we want it to go. And I believe that again, that is a very important kind of ideology to keep in mind, especially if you want to run for tribal leadership. I don't think tribal leaders should be people that are going in thinking that they want having that me, 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 me ideology, which is usually very sparse in mm-hmm. regards to American Indian leaders, but you always get um, a couple of those bad seeds, but usually you never want those bad seeds to begin with. That's true. But yeah, I just, I just, again, I just think people have a, just kind of a weird idea of why we do what we do and rather than actually see um, the real reason as why we, I guess, worship these sites. Oh, yeah. It's, I don't know. I think one thing I always kind of, this is one thing I kind of like think about is that and how American Indians are treated, even though it's like, it's not exactly a religion. It's much, it's much more wider and deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And you and if you were to hear about like a church a yeah. church burns down or somebody writes horrible things all over it it's or things news. like that it's on the news but with the american indians you don't understand that like the way that you desecrate the land or you desecrate where we find sacred of you know this is how much i respect my ancestors this is how much i respect the earth because this is what it gives me yeah exactly mm-hmm. it's not so much as respecting the land as respecting our ancestors and i, I really like that she said that and 
one thing is like it's it's very much like the you know the what is it called like an analogy of like you don't bite the hand that feeds you yeah most definitely mm-hmm. and it's but on a much larger and more significant scale that oh it's like at the core of most american american indians and on top of that it's just people don't understand that i'm not going to go into israel and i'm not going to go ahead and go oh yeah you know start keying the moss (laughs) yeah start keying the moss like people people go wild and it's just like here it's like you know bears your monument that's people don't care people don't care and they're they think about it as an environmental issue but also it is an environmental issue but that's at our core also but it's also a matter of you know this is where my people have been you know this is where you know my this is where we are yeah and uh, now that I got like this whole conversation has got my gears going a little bit. Um, it kind of, you kind of like stirred some stuff up um, in regards to saying, I believe it was, um, um, oh my God, I'm so some space. Think hard. Think no, hard. I feel oh, the same no, way. Brain, like we talk, fart, we talk about fart. stuff and I like try to keep it like, I try to hang on to it a little bit. It's like a little wispy and then yeah, it just like yeah. gets <laughs> in the wind. And you're like, oh yeah. man, there it goes. But, um, uh, what was it? Was it? Um, what did you What did you say? So I talked about the um, just how the equivalent of what Americans can go ahead and have with their own religion, oh, yeah, Christianity, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then also it's just like what's at our core. Yeah. So now, yeah, like now that you got my uh, gears going in my head a little bit, um, it makes a little bit more sense to me when I think about as to why uh, I guess the United States or just other um, groups outside, or I should just say, non-American Indian people. Uh, have an idea about sacred places is just because I feel like that whole family mentality and that um, that sort of like um, uh, that togetherness that you have with your family is more so an American Indian thing. Like we we stay close to mm. our family, our elders, our cousins, our sisters, our uncles, our brothers, our aunts. It's we c- stay connected to everybody. When nowadays um, most of these families don't even sit down for dinner anymore. And so I think that's why uh, we tend to have like a stronger connection in regards to sacred places and stuff like that is just because um, we're more tied in with our family and our, our connections with our community than the average person. I think that is a, an ideology that has been kind of wiped out in the recent years, especially as the oncoming years start to hit us. I believe that we're going to start to um, see the impact. Yeah, mm-hmm. start to spread out a little bit more away from that whole Andy Griffith idea of like dinner and that uh, sol- um, that uh, uh, not solitary, but that solidarity uh, that families have back in the day. Yeah, that is so rare to see nowadays. And then can I go ahead and like go off what you're saying? Yeah, it's like ahead. with our like with family, it's even in the way that we how like our how Navajos introduce ourselves. We go ahead and say that you know that's that family is tied into, you know, we where are. we are, yeah. where we start from. So, you know, say like with me, my first clan and how Navajo has introduced, introduced ourselves as name, first mother's clan, your father's clan, your paternal. mother's father. Or maternal. Yeah. yeah, yeah your maternal. mother's mother's clan. Father's clan. Father's. Okay. But we, we, okay. So we, okay. So let's go and clarify <laughs> it really quick. Let's clarify. I don't want to, I don't want to just like brush it off. So mother, Father, mother's mother. Mother's father. Mother's father. Father's Father's father. Yep. There we go. Yeah. Because the mother's clan is also... So, like, my mom's clan would be my clan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, with mine, my first clan from my mother is Deschini, which is the start of the Red Street people. Yeah, Yeah. that's what I'm saying. And we go into where we're from. You know that's the start of the people yeah. and then also we get into the bitter water people where like it's a Yay. specific area and then there's also the red streak people which is also another one of mine and that goes in sometimes they even go into creation stories yeah of oh, who yeah. we are yeah because i believe uh, totochini and uh was uh one of the original tribes that came from changing woman when she um rubbed uh, some of her s- extra skin off yeah and uh created the i think it was the first six or first seven original tribes or something like that exactly and i'm also totally genius so that would make us related yes and so we have like even we would help each other and that's even a larger aspect of family that goes straight into where we come from how we started from the start of our people 
Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is like these towns like Loop or Ganado, especially when you get into Tuba and especially with the Hopi people, that all of these towns, like these small towns are what people would consider really tiny towns that you only go through, you never stop in. These are towns made up of different families or basically contemporary villages, as I would, I would, mm-hmm. as I would put it. And so that camaraderie between just like an anonymous person, another anonymous person on the reservation, it's not, it's almost not existent. It's like you meet someone and then as soon as they guess you're native, it comes up the native check, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then you want to see what clans you got. And then you're like, Oh, Hey brother, uncle, cousin, you know what I mean? And so, but normal, uh, non-Indians just don't have that. They don't have any sort of that camaraderie. And I think back in the, um, uh, the eighties and the seventies back when it was really uh, time for activism, you know, with aim black, uh, the black Panther movement, uh, even the God awful KKK movement, just all those other just activists, um, coming around during the seventies. I believe that, um, uh, I don't even know what I was going with that. I was with those activists. They, um, family camaraderie, um, um, They don't have, non-Indians don't have that same camaraderie. Oh yeah, so during back in the activist times, you would normally see um, another person of color and then you just give them that sort of head nod. You know, and that was oh, just yeah. that was just kind of like the signal, of like you know, hey, we're really out here, you know. Yeah. You know, like, like <laughs> we're out here. Yeah, and so it's just, now that's even gone, you know, with non-Indians, that's not even there anymore. And even I personally, on a personal level, I've even felt that starting to dissipate with Indians themselves. You know, even when I see like a fellow American Indian walking down they the street, they just look away. Bruh. Yeah, they just put their head down. Huh? Like, yeah, exactly. No more head nods, dude. Like I, re- I remember hearing about all these things in different, like from different members of AIM, and just seeing like stories about like from Russell Means and John Trudell. Russell Means, you know, and they're uh, they all talk about like you know that head nod, that significant head nod, and it's just like that's gone. It's gone. It's now. gone. It's you gone. don't have it anymore. But I was just having this conversation with my friend the other night because he's White River Apache, but we we just seen an, an, a native. We don't know if he's Navajo yeah. or anything, but it's just when you see another native and you're out here in the city, you're like, man, I feel like I know them. Yeah. But, but just because you see, because you get used to seeing other other races out here and then you see an, a native, you're like, oh, man, that's cool. You get to oh, see yeah. and you, you feel like yeah. you know them, but yeah. but they don't want to look at you now. Or like, it's just it's it's weird. Yeah, it's yeah weird. it just gets awkward. You look away. And I think this is definitely one of those issues that our current or contemporary leaders should definitely be aware of. You know, I think that's something that we should try to tackle as leaders, because um, I know Noelle definitely says she might want to try to get into a political office at some point, possibly. I know I definitely want to get into a political office when I get older um, after I go through school and study tribal law Uh, but I just think that uh, this is definitely one of those issues that needs to be addressed and needs to be thought about with tribal leaders is that you know there's there's just this separation between this collectiveness that we used to have back in the day but nowadays it or in the contemporary years it's just it's it like I said it just doesn't seem to be as prevalent as it used to be oh yeah definitely but I think it's our time instead of waiting and telling them like how our leader should be. I think it's like you two want to go into um, native politics. It's our time. It's you two's time to go go ahead and do it yourself since you guys know like what you want to see in a leader. Why don't be that leader? Yeah. But also on a different note, it's like, well, I'm going to go ahead and just do like a little spurge of yeah, like what ahead. I exactly, go what I'm going to do. We're so like, editing. yeah. So <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm going to school for public service and public policy yeah. so I can actually work on policy and implement the things of, um, how they should play out. So if I were to someday I could go ahead and make sure like, yeah, let's go ahead and figure out a way where we can prosecute people for desecrating sacred lands, whether it's an enormous fine or whatever. Or but even put that, power in a nation's hands so that yeah. way they can actually prosecute their own criminals. Exactly. And putting that mm-hmm. into writing into the government. That's yep. what exactly I want to do. Not exactly be the face of anything. I want to be behind the scenes. But that's something because I actually want to apply to medical school yeah yeah so I take it I take everything with me so that like you know maybe in 30 years if I get to become an orthopedic surgeon and I finish my public service and public policy undergraduate degree and afterwards you know maybe afterwards I can work in the public health sector and fix yeah. you know no, um, no, I IHS you know like I kind of take that collectively so you don't have to be a leader to go ahead and be you know I want to make this change but it's also be an example for our youth or 
you know, like I'm saying, like in 30 years, 40 years from now, maybe I can work at IHS. I can be, you know, yeah. some chairperson to kind of fix these small issues. You don't have to go ahead and be the face of anything. You can be the behind the scenes or you can even just be a part of, you know, something small, like yeah. anything. There's different levels. It's not, you know, there's not just that plain paradigm yeah. of top mm-hmm. to the bottom. You know, grassroots also, they get movements going and stuff yep. like that. And there's there's plenty of different ways to kind of fix certain things or be a part of you know sacred places we share the stories of where our people come from where with whether we talk about it like right now mm-hmm. yeah. how we talk about our culture our history most definitely on a podcast so that's even like the smallest thing that kind of makes the change and i i think uh that you since you touched up on it, i think it's also um important to note that uh if you want to become a tribal leader, I feel like you need to start now. It's important to have these contingency plans to see what our current generation is doing wrong and then start planning for that. Um, like you said, you're starting, you want to go into school for medical law or not, or not medical law. You want to yeah, go into school for med, for, you want to go to med school. Yeah. I want to be a surgeon. And yeah. yeah. And so that's really sick. But if you did get into policy, you have a knowledge of health. You have knowledge of how human body works, how what it can react to and how it can react. And that becomes important, especially when you become a policymaker, because then you know how everything goes yeah. down. And so me, um, I'm trying to get a business degree right now. And I'm, like, my end goal is to become a tribal lawyer. And the reason I'm getting into business is because an issue that a lot of uh, nations are having right now is, is trying to figure out how to get money to come in and stay in the Navajo Nation and not leak out. And so what I want to do is I want to specify in economics and then use that knowledge of economics to go into law and then start practicing law for tribes and defend them, be able to maybe employ policies that can maybe bring in some more money or maybe open doors for entrepreneurship to hit the reservation. Um, So again, I think it's just really important for to have these contingency plans. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably like one of the number one things that uh, any future indigenous leader needs to think of. Um, so I think that wraps it up for today. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about real quick or maybe touch up on? No, um, I'm good. No, I'm good, man. Okay. So thank you guys for your time. We had a really great session. And again, this is going, this is the New Media Labs American Indian Lit Review. Um, my name is Natani Hanley. And I'm Nathan Johnson. And I am Noel Teller. Cool. Thank you so much.